morning uh, and welcome to the 12th meeting of 2014 of the uh, Public Audit Committee. Uh, I have apologies from uh, Tavi Scott and Liam MacArthur is here as a substitute and from uh, Colin Keir and David Torrance is here in Colin's place. Um, before I start the meeting, um, can I maybe draw members' attention um, to an issue that's been raised with me by James Dornan um, about a report which appeared, I believe, in the, the Sunday Herald um, prior to the publication of the committee's report on police reform. Um, can I remind members that the principles of the committee system in this parliament work on the basis of confidentiality and that information relating to the publication of private reports should not be given to the media prior to the publication of those reports. I think if members start to provide the media with details of the contents of private reports prior to the publication, then it would bring into question uh, the whole basis in which we produce those reports. So um, I hope that members will uh, take that to heart. Um, I'm not suggesting that it has been a member that has done it, but whoever is responsible um, has done no favours to the committee. Okay. So if we can move on, uh, item one, um, decisions on taking matters in private. Could we agree to take items six and eight in private? Um, item two, um, we have a section 23 report on modern apprenticeships. Um, we've previously heard from the Auditor General and uh, this morning, um, if we maybe want to invite uh, our witnesses, Katie Hutton, who's the Deputy Director of National Training Programmes, Fiona Stewart, Head of National Operations, Gordon McGuinness, the Deputy Director, Industry and Enterprise of Skills Development Scotland, and um, John McCormick, the Senior Deputy Director of Development and Delivery, uh, has been taken ill as unable to join us, and he's uh, been replaced by Andrew Livingston, the Director of finance and audit, and I believe, Mr. Livingston, that you would like to make uh, an opening statement to the committee. Thank you. <clears throat> We'd like to thank the committee for inviting us to discuss what we believe to be a positive report from Audit Scotland on the wider modern apprenticeship programme, including SDS's role in particular. It's important to recognise that SDS's role is primarily to administer the public funding contribution and to ensure that government, Scottish Government priorities are met through contracting with training providers, colleges and directly with employers across Scotland. The MA programme is demand-led and therefore dependent on the opportunities identified by employers. We, we must administer the programme in a way that is responsive to the needs of employers, but we must also support individual trainees. We take a lead role in the promotion of the programme to particularly young people and employers as recently demonstrated with last week's uh, highly successful Scottish Apprenticeship Week, which was coordinated by SDS and comprised more than 150 events across the country. The report recognises key positive aspects of the programme. Uh, our success in meeting a challenging start target of 25,000 starts per year, given the demand-led nature of the programme. The increase in the achievement rate it was 67% uh, in 2008-09, it was 77% in 2012-13, which are the most, the most uh, up-to-date available information. And increased prioritisation of young people reflected in the growing number of them starting a modern apprenticeship. These have been achieved in the challenging context of economic downturn and efficiency savings in both public and private sectors. We recognise, nonetheless, that there is room for improvement, including recognition that more needs to be done to address under-representation within frameworks with regard to gender, ethnicity and disability. Clearly, this is affected by societal and cultural issues beyond SDS, but we are committed to working with partners to effect real change and equal opportunity. Opportunities for greater penetration of the programme amongst employers. Currently, 13% of employers in Scotland are involved in the programme, so we'd like to increase this. There are demographic challenges where projections suggest that the number of 16 to 24-year-olds is set to fall between now and 2022. And this may, this may be the best time to consider widening and deepening the offer to foundation and advanced levels. 
continued work to improve the efficacy of the contracting process and to facilitate a greater understanding amongst employers and training providers of how it works is seen to be key. We are an organisation which seeks continuous improvement and therefore we welcome the report and its recommendations. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Livingston. Um, can I start off by asking um, a question on two different issues? Um, the first is your understandable concentration on younger uh, people. Um, you know, it's clear that we've had far too many young people unemployed in this country and that uh, to waste their talents um, is, is a drain not just on the economy, but it's a loss to the, to, to, to the country. Um, however, is there a danger that in concentrating on those younger people, um, you are neglecting older people who want to retrain and who want to reskill? But what Andrew's made clear is we're responsible for administering the public funding contribution. So again, all public funding is limited by what's available. Um, so we prioritise in line with policy, um, which is why um, the, um, the majority of our funding goes to 16 to 24 year olds in effect. Um, I think in terms of looking at what's there in the workforce in the future, in terms of a lot of people are already in the workforce who are going to be there in, in the long term future, then I suppose... Um, you know, it's about balancing priorities. I suppose that's it in terms of funding terms. It is about balancing um, what's there and what's the available funding. And I suppose with the recession, there has been a great deal of concentration on young people. Um, if we had more funding, perhaps we could look at older groups. And there are other ways to do it. We've got other support. We've got flexible training opportunities that are there where we offer 50% of the training costs up to £500 per individual, up to 10 employees, uh, up to 10 employees for companies with 100 employees or less, and there are enough other initiatives out there too. I accept what you're saying about uh, priorities and limited funding. However, the question I was asking is, are older uh, people um, out with that young age group being disadvantaged? Um, are they being let down by the, by the concentration on, on younger people, or are you entirely satisfied that the offer that's available to those over the age of 24, 25 is satisfactory? I mean, I suppose part of that question is a matter for government policy about what's available in terms of the future and what's, what's available for older groups. Yeah, I, I'm asking, mm -hmm. you, you're the professional, you deliver mm -hmm. the programmes as you've suggested to me. Um, you're you're uh, individually and, and you as an organisation and your staff um, are the ones who deal with those who are unemployed and who are seeking to retrain and retool. I'm asking you, uh, is that age group being let down from what you are experiencing? Um, are they being disadvantaged in the concentration on younger people? I think we... What we're doing in, in the board has uh, recently reviewed the kind of patterns and trends of, of unemployment, and there has been an increase in, in the kind of older age group uh, chair, and that's something that we're going to uh, revisit at a, a further board meeting. A lot of the work we do takes place in partnership through community planning partnerships, and the majority of these have local employability partnerships. So responding to, to that uh, question, we would probably address that at a local level uh, as well as nationally. There obviously is provision for older age groups within the, the national training programmes. I think the statistics reflect that. Uh, work with industry around how we would uh, create different entry routes into the programme, not just through traditional college and modern apprenticeships. We've done some very good work in the energy sector. Uh, using the Energy Skills Challenge Fund to do transition courses, perhaps from areas that uh, people have been unemployed or armed services. But it's an area that the board have reviewed and will continue to review. But as I said, also work in partnership with our local authority partners uh, in, in addressing issues at a local level. I understand that you respond locally and it's a local as well as a, a national issue. And presumably that in doing that, you then are able to compile statistics which 
are available not just locally but then <coughs> aggregated nationally. And I come back to the question I'm asking, um, irrespective of what, 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 what you say, is that older age group being disadvantaged or are you satisfied that everything possible has been done for that older age group? I don't necessarily think they are being uh, disadvantaged. I think there is opportunities to bring them back into the labour market. Statistically, that number has grown of the, that older <coughs> age group. That's an age group that's not just serviced by ourselves, it's serviced by the Department of Work and Pensions and the Work Programme. And I think you could look to, to that type of programme to say that that could be more effective and more successful. And that's where I think we also need to do a bit of work in, in partnership at our local a local level. Uh, changes in the colleges, I think, uh, again, a refocus on the, the younger age group and probably the balance of provision has changed in the college sector as well. But it's perhaps something that we could do a further review in terms of the statistical profile of that older age group and return to committee with. That would be helpful, but who then is looking at the needs and demands of that older age group in, in relation to modern apprenticeships? Who, who has the overall responsibility? You've got to be employed. Um, so that, that's key. That's, so that's about whether also businesses have a part to play this in terms of looking at the needs, um, the needs and skills of their own workforce. So to be honest, in terms of when you're talking about the older age group, that's really about what the business needs, what the skills of the individuals who are employed by that business um, want and where you would go forward with that. So again, companies are part of that because the overall thing about it, modern apprenticeships and what we do is a, it's a contribution to, towards, towards really what are the objectives of the business in terms of moving forward. The, the, the second question I had was um, the, the, the issue about, can I, if you would like to describe it as high value um, apprenticeships as opposed to the, kind of gate, the gateway apprenticeships, which are often uh, available in, in higher numbers, you know, the, the, there is some evidence that for a lot of younger people, um, opportunities in retail um, are, you know, uh, partly just of what's available. Not for, you know, don't get me wrong; I'm not for a moment suggesting that we do away with high-value, high-end apprenticeships because we need to retool and reskill. Um, those employed in our manufacturing sector and, and, and other sectors. But equally, is there a danger that in shifting the focus towards that, that we start to lose some focus on the end where there are greater numbers of, of, of young people engaged in modern apprenticeships, such as in retail? We always... Um, we always strive to strike a balance between entry level positions and also the higher level um, the higher level opportunities that are available. So you'll see that we continue, you know, one of the highest areas um, support for MEs over the last few years has been retail, has been hospitality, entry level jobs. So it's always trying to balance that, to be honest, in terms of how we go about our contracting process. Colin Beatty. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to just explore a little bit about uh, gender imbalance. And I'm looking at uh, page six of the SDS uh, submission here, which gives some interesting statistics, for example, about the higher proportion of females and males going on to further and higher education, which uh, it's uh, put forward here actually skews the number of uh, females that are actually available for apprenticeships. Obviously, there's imbalances in certain areas within the, uh, within the modern apprenticeships. What, what action has been successful in overcoming the barriers for uh, women to get into these different areas? Um, we undertake a range of activities, and it's really framed around sort of three things. One, are, one is looking at are there any structural barriers in terms of apprenticeships. Um, one is the cultural and misconceptions, etc. And the other thing is about personal choice. Um, so in terms of structure... We've looked. At, we've undertaken an equality impact assessment of how we operate modern apprenticeships, and we can we can't find any barriers to it in terms of how we actually operate it, and we wouldn't tolerate it. There's quite a lot of women involved in administering modern apprenticeships within SDS. Um, we also um, we also, as part of our contractual requirements, all the providers have 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 got to operate equal opportunities policies as well. And we do things like capacity building. 
And we've got another programme this year. We've published the quality toolkit, online training materials, etc. And also, um, we've got we've appointed a head of national training programme development who has got a specific responsibility looking at the whole kind of equal opportunities angle there as well. Um, we've um, undertaken diversity workshops with our own staff, etc. Um, also, on the cultural side of things, we've got specific initiatives, and we funded STUC to do some work in terms of um, working with employers and trying to spread the message, etc. There are specific industry initiatives through our skills investment plans, etc. We've got an ICT manager developing range of workshops, etc., and ICT careers, and construction skills, and as has uh, industry leadership group. Um, in the SIP, it's proposed to establish a diversity and equality task force. Um, and we've got, we're sponsoring a PhD student to look at this area. So we are involved in a whole range of initiatives. But in, just to give you an example of, of and there has been an, an increase. I mean, if you look at apprenticeships um, in 2008-9, 27% were female, 41% um, are uh, in 2013-14 are women. Now, the biggest difference to that is the occupational mix that you were mentioning Earlier, you know, the occupational mix. If you if you bring in um, um, certain types of occupations, you'll get more female participation. But the challenge is with the high value sectors. Um, and just to ex just to illustrate the point here, we've been working a lot with the Institute of Physics, looking at you know the statistics coming through there. Seventy percent of individuals at Scottish schools um, doing hires are males, and are, 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 are doing are males. Of the 90% of females, then of that 30% um, who actually, you know, pass, they all go into the 90% of them go into FE and HE. So we're talking about a big issue across the piece, and it's not as if um, I've read some of the academic literature on this. It's not as if the academics all agree with what the solution to that is. Some of them argue for single-sex schools. Some of them argue for, um, for other things. Our training providers. Um, what, you know, we've talked to the ones in things like automotive engineering. They make, you know, big efforts to try and attract girls. But, you know, some figures um, in terms of in the last year, you know, big providers who act as recruitment agents effectively for businesses are, you know, saying that 3% and 4% of applicants are female. So this is, a, you know, this is a wider issue. Um, I think we're putting a lot of effort into it, but it, it takes a long time to ch change cultural values, personal choice, etc. Just one comment you made to make sure I, I understood it. You seem to be implying that uh, females were going into less high-value jobs in terms of you know modern apprenticeships. It, that, that seemed to be what you were saying. By the kind of higher levels, kind of skills activity, like you're doing engineering at level three, for instance, that that sort of thing. Sorry, that was the wrong term that I used. I mean, one of the, one of the ways around this is, as you know from the Wood report that mentioned the introduction of things like foundation apprenticeships. And that might be the way of, of putting the apprenticeship, part of the apprenticeship down further in the school system to try and generate more interest um, from among girls in particular subject areas. And, and the reverse is true for boys, I think, in terms of, of, of you know, get, getting young boys interested in things like care as a career. And we know that that's an issue. Um, so, you know, a wide range of activities by a wide range of, of partners. Um, and I know that FE's got the same issue and HE's got the same issue about subject choice too. What would you say was the, the biggest success within that in terms of uh, correcting gender imbalance? <coughs> What's been the most successful As I approach? Said, if you look at sheer numbers at the moment, it's across the ME programme in particular. It's actually about the, the range of careers that are on offer. That would that would be the main one, I think, in terms of. But just um, things that we've done, like case studies. You know, the more that you can do that, case studies about um, you know, girls in, in in sort of in occupations that you would, you wouldn't normally find them, etc. And just getting out to the school system as well. We touch there on the different levels of apprenticeships. How many individuals actually progress from a lower to higher level of apprenticeships? And are there plans to increase that? Um, in terms of moving progressions, we, I, we, the figures um, were provided in the um, Audit Scotland supplementary submission. I think we've gone to about 579 and 1213. I can't give you the 13, 14 figures because we're the subject of, of um, Office of National Statistics. What I can say, that's increased again. Now, that's down to, in terms of plans to increase, so obviously we encourage it, but it's down to the demands of the job and whether the business wants to move someone. So if you start in, so let's take retail, for instance, as you mentioned, Chairman. 
Retail, the jobs in retail at level two are sales assistant, but the jobs at level three are sales supervisor. So it would need to be whether that individual was deemed at that point in time to move then into a supervisory role, etc. So it's down to the demands of the business whether they do move, but and we are seeing an increase um, over the last three years in terms of progressions from level two to level three. Just one last question for a clarification for me. What's the difference between the main differences anyway between uh, skill seekers training program and level two apprenticeships? Um, there is a difference. The difference between the skill seeker um, and the level two apprenticeship is the inclusion of five core skills. The skill seeker program was merely an SVQ level two delivered um, in the workplace. And I suppose the other thing is, um, in terms of skill seekers, when the skill seeker program was phased out back in 2006, I think Mr. Hendry was um, maybe in the department at that time. Um, it was predominantly level of three. Um, young people um, undertook. But the level two skill seeker has actually been um, very successful um, as a programme and was built on um, to come, in, come up with um, the level two MA to include the core skills. So that's things like problem solving, in ICT, working with others, the softer skills that employers quite often cite as being missing from young people in the workplace. So that was an improvement um, with the addition of um, core skills. Thank you. Um, Bruce Crawford. Okay, thank you, I mentioned the Wood Report, uh, Katie Hutton, and certainly looking at that, it's quite interesting read in terms of particular areas, particularly when you look at the benefit of early intervention. And they estimated, I think, the figure was an annual benefit cost for 100 unemployed young people is a £500,000 per annum, which you know, is a substantial sum. So um, when you're setting priorities in, in these circumstances, then do you agree that early, pre early prevention is key um, to, to keeping costs down in the long term? Because if we don't act early, then the costs in the longer term are going to be much more significant. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, anybody that falls out of the system is a, is a huge cost to the system, as you know, as you know, going forward. And it's a waste of talent. And it's you know, we've got um, you know, we know that in terms of um, industries going forward with their growth and development plans, we need we need people to be skilled, and we need them to, you know, to to, to have clear progression and clear routeways and pathways through the system. And you know, that that's also up to things like industries themselves being clear about. Um, you know where the career, where the careers are in their particular industries, and that's through the work of the things like the, the skills investment plans. We're working on that too. So, I mean, yes, I think um, the less remedial activity you have to do um, in terms of, of you know developing people's skills further, and, and the less you know if people become disengaged, then it takes a, a while to bring them back to where they need to be in terms of developing their skills and potential. I'm interested also how you, how we're going to make that bridge between. That early intervention work that's rightly going on with young people trying to make sure that we don't create a greater cost for society further down the road into the more high skilled apprenticeship area. So I'd like to understand how that journey is going is, is go to, and I know it's early yet and you're only beginning that process, but if you can give us a feeling about how you're going to move into that higher skilled agenda, which is about, about skilling up our economy for a, a different future. Plans are developing, you know, at the moment they're being discussed about how you do that. But one of the one of the, the ways is through, for instance, um, if you can take some of the elements of a modern apprenticeship out of actually, you know, from what's there, what they would be doing in the workplace, and actually bring it back into the school system. So you do taught learning elements. Um, you might do things like performing engineering operations that you can do, and you, you can give them more work experience as part of it as well, to, so that going you know, into the world of work isn't a shock. They're used to that whole environment, etc. So there's quite a bit of work to say, to, to say, right, OK, what would be the career routeway within that industry? What might you be able to do in the school setting so that you can actually then progress people into the workplace you know, quicker than they, that they might have done and actually you know, f um, get them used to... Um, to particular industries, you know, because sometimes you get drop out with people saying, well, actually, this isn't, I want to be a hairdresser, but actually I find that standing on my feet and working on a Saturday and all sorts of things isn't really what they want to do. So the more that you can actually get people engaged in the career earlier on, then they can, then, then you know, they, they're better able to make better choices then. Obviously, much of what 
um, happens in terms of the framework of all of this is driven by the employers and their needs. Um, and therefore, and, and I know that in terms of the level of support that, come in, that comes in from employers, it's significant. In fact, I was surprised to see just how much the differential was. Um, if it's, and uh, I understand that it costs around eighty-five thousand pounds a year in total to train a, an engineering apprenticeship, for for instance, and, for, and from public funding only makes up nine thousand of that. So as we make the transition from into the higher skill element, and we're going to increase by twenty to, from, from twenty-five thousand to thirty thousand by twenty twenty. I'm assuming then that a lot of that uptake is going to have to come as much from the public sector as, and it's going to need a significant support also from the private sector involvement. So I just wanted to understand how you see these various um, contributions from the public sector and the private sector developing over that time, because over that five year period it's going to be important that we get the right flow of income in to support this activity to get the numbers we're trying to achieve. I think if we deploy successfully um, the resource in the school system together with you know, our public funding resource um, post-school. So, for example, um, Katie mentioned the performing manufacturing operations or performing engineering operations. Um, if that's done in the school and it's completed successfully, then the individual will be a very attractive option for an employer coming out because they would automatically move into year two of their apprenticeship. So the business would benefit because they're not having to bear the costs of employment for year one, but they're getting someone who is um, partially productive in year two. Um, and so therefore, you know, hopefully... Um, businesses who don't already buy into the apprenticeship programme would see it as an attractive option and would allow us to penetrate the market you know, to greater levels than we have previously. I think it can add to that. So we're just back to your thing about the balance of industries, etc. Yes, I mean, you know, at the moment the announcement's been made and we're looking at, you know, where that demand's going to come from for high level skills. So we're looking at, you know, things like the skills investment plans, what they say for the key and economic growth sectors. The other thing is the public sector. You know, the public sector has to, to also step up to the mark here. And, you know, there are, there are you know, areas to explore within the NHS, for instance, which are highly skilled areas as well, to make greater penetration into as well than we have done. So, so it will come from a mix in all parts of the economy in Scotland um, contributing to that. Uh, one, last, one last question, because I visited Prudential at Craig Forth mm -hmm. in my own constituency last week as part of Apprenticeship Week. And they, and they are now beginning to up, up the numbers of apprenticeships they're taking in. But their experience was quite illuminating to me because they, it's obviously an industry where they thought they had to always bring in more experienced people, more people with, 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 who started higher up the level with skills. But they've learned a lot from taking in the apprenticeships and actually converting a lot of more of them into full-time jobs now. Now, if Prudential are only just beginning to understand the benefit of bringing a young person in, skilling them, getting them used to their own culture, developing within their own organisation. There must be a fair bit of work requiring to be done, by, even in the financial sector, with, a, with, with employers to make them recognise actually the value that they can get out for their own organisation out of taking an apprenticeship. So, and therefore, you'd expect in these circumstances that the private sector would be prepared to put a bigger contribution in if they are beginning to recognise the net worth of, in, of employing individuals. It's only recently that the insurance sector and financial sector have really um, taken on board apprenticeships and in this last um, few months we have actually approved at the Modern Apprenticeship Group a number of frameworks um, including you know, accountancy, professional services, insurance and banking. Um, and so therefore the frameworks are new, the Sector Skills Council and industry bodies are promoting them actively at the moment to try to encourage some of these employers to take up um, more apprenticeships. Um, a, a good example is KPMG for example, um, they're opening a new operations in Glasgow and they're recruiting a substantial number of apprentices because they see the value of you know, growing their own workforce in terms of loyalty and productivity in the longer term. Yeah, I thought that was key because one of the things that Prudential are certainly capable of doing as other organisations is upskilling their workforce significantly but by their training methods, by the process they go through their human resource development process. So that would help us get to that higher skilled 
um, economy we're looking for in the future. Thank you. The other thing they're doing also is they're um, promoting higher level apprenticeships. So they're seeing the higher level apprenticeships as promotion opportunities for people in the workplace and opening up entry level jobs at both level two and level three for individuals. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I apologise for being a couple of minutes late. I've just got into the routine of coming here at 9.30 for 10, so sorry about that. Um, can I go to uh, uh, those not in uh, employment, education and training? Uh, just following on from Colin Beatty's question, I think uh, we're all pleased about gender equality and apprenticeships. But I was surprised last week that uh, the number of males last year, well, since 2011 to date, uh, the number of males... Uh, not in employment training and education, employment education training has fallen by 4,000. But for the first time, the number of females has increased by 1,000. Uh, why is that? These are surely the people that, you know, you are there to, to help. It's, it's not always the case. For, um, in, I mean, that, that's not a homogenous group that you're talking about, for instance. So people who are not on employment, education and training may have a variety of needs. It may be, for instance, that an employability programme is actually more appropriate for them than necessarily going straight into the workplace. So they need preparatory support before they can take up an opportunity. I want to know why there's more... Fe why the, it's good news for men, for males, and why there's... You know, the figures are going in the opposite direction for females. I the that you offer, but can I just ask, is it a matter of concern that you look at? Well, you know, I think it's a matter of concern for all local employability partnerships across Scotland, and we're partnered in every single one, in the 32 across across the country, about neat figures, about look, um, about making sure that there, there are opportunities for all across the piece, and, and it is monitored at a local level. One of the big areas for us there is looking at is the development of um, the data hub support, and we've got 30, um, 30 out of 32 local authorities actively, you know, actively engaging, putting data so that people could be tracked and offers can be made. The two that aren't in at the moment are just down to technical issues that we're working with them on as well. So there's a, there's a whole infrastructure, I think, in place across Scotland with local employability partners to look at the offer that's there um, in terms of providing support um, for individuals. And a lot of that is down to what opportunities are available in the local area. That there's not there's opportunities for males, but you know because they're falling by four thousand. But from your answer, all I can gauge is that there's a lack of opportunities for females. Well, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that that I think there's a range of support measures in place. Um, in terms of um, that, there'll be, there'll be opportunities across the piece, and it's about what individuals want to do there. There are more girls, for instance, that go directly into FE and HE than males. So people make different choices too. I do you understand that? Uh, why, do, why is modern apprenticeship starts fallen by over 400 last year and they were down the previous year by 736? You know, given that uh, there's 29,000 NEETs, as we call them, why are modern apprenticeships falling rather than rising? Because I know it's a government target to increase uh, modern apprenticeship starts, I think, to 30,000. It's a demand-led programme and it reflects the demands of employers. Um, Skills Development Scotland has a target of 25,000 apprenticeship places and we have met that in um, every year since the target has been there. Um, we de respond to employer demand and provide places for young people and adults in key sectors um, and so therefore um, the numbers reflect the demand um, raised by employers. And can I just ask about the Skill Seekers programme? You mentioned it in response, I think it was to Colin Beattie. Um, paragraph 14 mentions that SVQ Level 2 apprenticeships, when they were introduced in 2009-10, they replaced Skill Seekers now, this was the subject of uh, considerable discussion at a previous meeting. How many uh, young people, 16 to 19, in the Skill Seekers programme were transferred to modern apprenticeships? Well, none of them were transferred to 
involved in apprenticeships because they'd started on the Skillseeker programme. So they completed their Skillseeker programme and it was only new starts after the date of phasing out that actually started on a level two modern apprenticeship. So that was the VQ2 plus the core skills. And they were... Skillseeker's programme prior, you know, the year before 2009-10, how many were relabeled, if you like, as modern apprenticeships well, at the end of that? They weren't relabeled. Um, not every... Um, sectoral area chose to have a level two apprenticeship. Those who had level two skill seekers did not automatically have a level two apprenticeship programme approved, for example, engineering, because there were no jobs at that level. There was no entry level jobs. The jobs are at level three in the industry. Um, employers previously used um, the level two um, to feed into the level three programme. <laughs> Um, and when the Level 2 apprenticeship was introduced, the engineering sector, for example, decided that they wouldn't have that. Another sector who chose not to have Level 2 apprenticeships, although they had Level 2 skill seekers, was the social care. So children's child care, learning and development don't have a Level 2 apprenticeship. So it's not an automatic, if there was a skill seeker in Level 2, that there would have automatically been a, a Level 2 apprenticeship. How many people were on the skill seekers programme? prior to uh, the, uh, being replaced by modern apprenticeships, as is stated in paragraph 14. Hang on. I think Audit Scotland provided the budget figures, didn't they? I mean, position, but I can't remember yeah, if I they provided the, the starts. So we'll get the starts for you. Yeah, I don't have the figures to hand. The report, um, the Auditor General uh, was quite critical about modern apprenticeships not being aligned to the Scottish Government's uh, top economic growth sectors. And recently we had a debate on the ICT digital strategy, which I note uh, is not in the top ten of uh, apprenticeships. But uh, I think it was just about a fortnight ago we had a debate on the life sciences strategy and out of 25,000 apprenticeships, uh, I think between 13 and 20 were in life sciences. So uh, that was quite a critical point from the Auditor General. <coughs> Are you now looking at aligning modern apprenticeships with sustainable employment, good earnings, etc., you know, and areas that the government have targeted for economic growth? Because it doesn't seem to have been the case in the past. Up. Uh, life sciences, when we've, we've worked and developed the uh, sector skill investment plan, and we do that in conjunction with industry through LISAB, the industry uh, advisory board, uh, it's probably one of the areas where the natural pattern for recruitment has been at graduate level. Uh, when we introduced the modern apprenticeship programme and worked with SEMTA and employers groups to do that, Initially, with a good uptake, that was incentivised at the time, and we virtually had a kind of two for one offer where we were offering a wage subsidy. So it was an initial uptake of the programme, but I think the sector has also went through a bit of a challenging time as well. So the numbers have probably dropped to a level where it's been, uh, from an industry point of view, a wee bit more sustainable. It's an area where we will look through the introduction of the uh, action plan for life sciences to further promote. But we'll probably see the biggest focus uh, within the skill investment plan around improving the connection uh, between graduates within the sector, uh, promoting internships. We've been doing some work through the Glasgow Economic Commission and their Life Sciences Action Group in terms of just making better uh, representation from individuals into the sector. We've done things like CV competitions and sponsored internships over the, over the summer. So in terms of looking at the future workforce, I would probably uh, still maintain that there's a, a heavier contribution to be made through probably both further and higher, but particularly higher education. Uh, the modern apprenticeship programme can make an offer and we'll put a bit uh, additional resource behind that in terms of the action plan. We're doing a lot of work through the kind of STEM agenda, linking back into the school system. So I think that, that runs across both engineering, uh, ICT, the, the, all, those, the, all those disciplines. So we are doing more promotional work in schools 
uh, and we will probably see an uptake, a further uptake of the, the modern apprenticeship. But uh, as I said, I think it's more at a graduate level that we'll see entry points into industry. I come to a final yeah. question. Was the Auditor General right to say uh, in her report, we can't talk about what's happening in the future, we can only talk about uh, what, what we've got in front of us. Was she right to say that uh, you had failed to apply to synchronise modern apprenticeships with uh, outcomes, sustainable employment and the government's economic growth sectors? The report says. I think that the report says um, that compared to key sectors, you know, it says economic <coughs> growth sectors. I think the other thing is an issue of data classification. For instance, engineering apprenticeships are classified under key sectors, not economic growth sectors. But obviously, engineering apprenticeships support a wide range of economic growth sectors too. So, I think um, that we do align it with the key and economic growth sectors. At the other, at the other part of that, we're also asked to make sure that there's entry-level opportunities, as, as the Chairman said at the very start of this session, opportunities within retail and other types of occupation too. So it's always a balance. But I think if you look at the increases we've had, you know, hospitality and tourism, which is an economic growth sector, is up nearly 700 between 10, 11 and 12, 13. Food and drink is up over 600. It starts. Energy is up over 600. Um, so financial services up over 80. Life sciences, Gordon's talked about the challenges there in terms of employer behaviour about the types of routes they prefer to use for their industry. So, you know, there is work to do with economic growth sectors, but I do think that we've made great inroads there. Can I just say, paragraph <coughs> 3 on page 7, one of the key messages, Scottish Government has set various priorities for modern apprenticeships, which is fair, but existing performance measures do not focus on long-term outcomes such as sustainable employment. So I'm just going to my final uh, question. Uh, you've also been um, criticised for, uh, where, well, less than 10% of the training goes to FE colleges. Um, and it's also mentioned on page 34, uh, Exhibit 10. Um, there are no equivalent independent reviews of the quality of training provided by other training providers. So qualities are ve uh, colleges are, you know, inspected uh, all the time by, by various people. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a, a lack of independent reviews of uh, many of the training providers bringing into question the quality of the training provided. Is that something that you'll take on board from this report? Can I um, just come in there on the colleges in terms of the number of starts? Um, obviously, we work very closely with colleges and we value the work that they actually deliver for us. And they bid into the process um, to get places in the same way as private training providers, employers, third sector organisations do as well. And they are um, judged on the same basis. And the things that we judge um, our training providers on are the quality of achievements, the number of achievements, the ability to deliver the numbers. Um, and unfortunately, colleges have in the past let us down, both in terms of achievement and in terms of delivering um, numbers. Um, I think sometimes, you know, they're very good at delivering taught learning, theoretical learning, but their engagement with employers is not always the best. And employers don't necessarily go to colleges to do workforce development, which essentially is what apprenticeships are. Um, we have... Wrong when she said there are no equivalent independent reviews of the quality of training provided by other, including private training providers, Sorry, I'm still answering in relation to colleges. I beg your pardon. I'm still, I'm still answering the part about you know the provision and the number of places that we deliver through colleges. Um, we work with 23 colleges direct, and our apprenticeship programme, for example, is inspected by Education Scotland, the stuff that's delivered through um, colleges. So there is, for colleges, delivery an independent aspect. We also have our own um, internal compliance um, function, and we rely on the um, quality of um, the accreditation bodies. So, for example, 
um, Scottish uh, Vocational Qualification Authority and also City and Guilds and other accreditation who also provide independent of Skills Development Scotland a review of activity delivered through um, training providers who all have to be approved and accredited by those organisations. Can I answer that in terms of you did ask about what we're going to do there? I mean, I think the comments we've made about colleges there was some, some are really great, some are less great than others. You know, it's, it's the, we've got some really good colleges in Scotland who are delivering in the Modern Apprenticeship Programme and so, and like any provider, you get differences in terms of approach. I think in terms of um, going forward, I think we, we've got robust and proportionate quality assurance systems, but you know, we recognise that, that you should always look to continuously improve. So we are taking on board um, sort of things that were mentioned there. We're revising the roles of our own contract, managers, contract management staff. To, to spend even more time out talking to trainees. I mean, I think what we should say is every time we survey um, modern apprentices and employers, we get high quality ratings when we ask them. So that's good. We'd also um, get a supporting staff development programme for our staff covering quality. There is, um, at the moment, we're formalising arrangements with um, all of the awarding um, bodies in terms of our respective roles, future plans and sharing information. And also, um, we're talking with Education Scotland at the moment and with um, Scottish Government about that external quality assurance of off-the-job training that's going on, about that being applied to all of the Modern Apprenticeship Programme too. Um, and there's quite a bit of work that's going on in terms of looking at how we might look at that. I think what you've got to be clear here as well is that in the setup of apprenticeships and in the setup of, of competence-based qualifications which form the heart of apprenticeship, they were not supposed to be the same as college-delivered um, qualifications as such. It's about competence on the job um, being assessed and ascribed. So therefore, um, what we're in terms of our discussions with Education Scotland about how they apply their inspection process to the whole of apprenticeships, it, it's got to be mindful of that. You know that, that it is different, and it was deliberately designed to be different because, in the whole setup, back to things like towards the skills revolution, etc., the idea was that it would be very different from what was currently delivered. So it's got to be proportionate to what actually the type of learning that, that does go on. It does say that, uh, again, page thirty-four. There's no formal independent review of training providers providing on-the-job training. So uh, I think I've had long enough here, but okay. uh, I can only go by what's read in the report here. Willie okay. Coffey. Um, thanks very much, Thanks, Amy. I've got the Auditor-General's report in front of me, and it's, it's one of the most positive reports I've ever read at this Audit Committee, serving on this for seven years or so. And I, I'm afraid I don't recognise some of the comments that my colleagues are offering about folk being neglected and let down and critical and failure. I think this is an incredibly positive story and she's, she's acknowledged that in her comments in the report. Uh, I did want to pick up on some of the themes that my colleague Mary Scanlon introduced there, though, about long-term outcomes and about quality. To ask you where, where the opportunities for further gain will be, I mean, if, if we look ahead and, and track the progress of say, the 25,000 or so apprentices that are in the system at the moment. Is it your brief to, to, to look ahead further to see how successful they are becoming, how, how sustainable their employment is, and how they're developing their earning capacity and so on? Or is it no? Is that, is that not part of your brief? What, what we do at the moment is that, um, in fact, we've got, there's more data on this than other forms of post-16 learning, but what we do is we um, survey individuals six months post-completion. Um, it's easier to get in touch with them then, to be honest, because um, you know how difficult when people move, etc., and phone numbers change and all that sort of stuff. So we track people post-16, and we get very good results for that. You know, completers are in the 90s in terms of in a job. Um, even, even, um, and we compare that to non-completers, etc. So post-16 completions of modern apprenticeships, over, you know, well over 90% are actually in a job post-completion, so that's good. We also ask them things like, what effect, you know, has it had on, have you had a career change? You know, have you had an increase in pay, etc.? So we ask them impact questions like that um, in our surveys. And again, you get good re results for that. And I think things like career change and promotion, etc., and a wage rise, six, I mean, six months isn't long after, you know, completing your apprenticeship. So again, the long-term aspect, the big prize in that is to actually link up with things like um, HMR HMRC data. 
And we have been talking to the Scottish Government about how we might do that in the future. And it's really in the gift of HMRC whether or not they allow access to those kind of data. But that, because surveys are expensive in, you know, to maintain, um, etc. Whereas HMRC would provide us with coverage, a great deal of coverage in terms of tracking people in the long term. I think if you track people, you know, you've got a lot of diminishing returns. What you know, we survey them two years after an apprenticeship. We serve, you know, their addresses will have changed and all that, and that's very expensive. Then you know, trying to catch up with that. So we do it post six, post six months. Good results on that, but we think there's a bigger prize there, and uh, we'll see how those discussions go with HMRC about. Joining and also linking it with the benefits data as well. Do then go to, to try to capture that information and feed it back into the planning process for a modern apprenticeship programme to, to make the kind of improvements that the Auditor General was leading, well, leading think, us towards? I think the other thing I would say is politicians also have to be patient as well because you want to see results very, very quickly. Are you prepared to wait to see, well, okay, the five year result of that, the 10 year result, etc., of it? So I think that um, we, you know, one of the things with what the Auditor General said, look at long term outcomes. We do, we have impacts, as I say, in terms of impact measures ourselves. We're talking to government about what that means in terms of looking at the longer term measures as well and how we might go forward. But as I say, we've got already started some of that with um, government pursuing HMRC and looking at the benefits side of it as well. That's, that's fantastic. It's very encouraging to hear that. Just and on the quality assurance front, I wonder if we could again use it, pick up a theme that. Mary Scanlon introduced here. I mean, where, where are we really on the kind of broadness of quality assurance frameworks? Because she did, she did say in her report that yourselves and various awarding bodies have got different QA procedures. Is there a worth in standardising it, or have they all got their own individual merits that they bring to the table? She kind of pushed us into thinking in that direction. So, what, what are your views about that, and where are the Similarly, where are the opportunities to gain in there, if there are any? I, th I think what the Auditor General mentioned, which is like um, there's a different inspection regime for colleges. So that's um, independent assurance given by um, Education Scotland now. What we've said is that we've there are a number of measures in place to give quality assurance already around modern apprenticeships. That's the processes that the awarding bodies, they, they quality assure in terms of, of <coughs> awarding centres. We we have our assess our quality assurance process, which we developed, looked at EFQM, looked at what Education Scotland had, etc. We've built it around that, and what that and also it was on the principle of self assessment, which was the advice given in the career review that quality assurance should be along the lines of self assessment. Now, recently, um, government have said that um, they would look to see want to see Education Scotland apply. Um, independent inspection against modern apprenticeships. So basically, the, basically there will be a change to that policy in terms of self-assessment. We're continuing with what we're doing already, but we've already talked to Education Scotland about going down the Education Scotland inspection route for off-the-job learning, which we'll do. But you know, there is another aspect of saying this is different. It's a bit like saying you know you run a company. And um, Education Scotland are going to come in and tell you how good your training is, because most of the, the training is done by the employer. So, you know, you need to balance this appropriately, because on the other hand, all the time you get people, you know, on the one hand, you must do this, you must do that, and then people will complain about bureaucracy too. So you've got to get that right. We're absolutely, it's absolutely key that quality assurance is there, and we do have processes in place, but there are going to be changes made to it. That, that employers are willing to engage with the whole QA process. I mean, I'm familiar with QA and EFQM and other standards. And so are you finding that they're growing towards that uh, and, and seeing it as a useful tool? And, and who, you know, who, who assesses the employer's quality of training and do they adopt the standards that you're talking about? Do they, it's basically, the, it's the job of the training provider college, whatever, to make sure that the the training, you know, the training arrangements that are there are that fit with the nine quality standards that we've got in our quality assurance processes. You know, you could talk to one employer who'll give you a different answer from another one in terms of you know someone will say, well, I'm not going to follow that route. This is all just bureaucracy or red tape. But again, it's about an, an appropriate balance. Well, no. mm -hmm. I think it's to establish a view around inspection and review and standard setting. The reality is probably everybody that drives a car, their car is serviced by somebody who's come through a modern apprenticeship programme. Their gas central heating system has probably been installed and maintained by somebody who's come through a modern apprenticeship programme. Your electrics and virtually every other, other trade that you'll touch. So these are standards that are often set by industry, so construction skills and other trades of a Scottish Joint Industry Board. 
young people set end tests when they complete that. So I think there's a difference between inspection, review and the standards that are set across qualifications to make sure that people are competent, as, as Katie touched on. I think if, if I could just add as well, the Katie mentioned the SDS quality assurance framework and that um, is EFQM based and we do assess it. So therefore we, we can build that into the contracting process. So more than 250 training providers, employers and colleges are signed up to undertake that process. And there are only two who are on development programmes at the moment. So the rest are compliant with the standards. So, and therefore, as it's industry led, the, there, is a, there is a link that we can make there too, but there is, there is always more we can do. At this committee, we've been talking about standards in the public sector and embracing quality and continuous improvement. So what you're saying to me, I think actually encourages me more that, 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 that employers are willing to embrace these kinds of standards to, to, to bring the, the kind of level and competencies up. So I'm quite happy with that, convener. Thank you. Thank you. McIntosh. Uh, thanks so much, convener. And uh, if I can just con uh, continue on the same line of questioning, if I may. Uh, first of all, though, the general point uh, that the Auditor General made was that the uh, overall aim for the um, Modern Apprenticeship Programme has been changed since 2007, despite a number of changes to uh, well, the labour market, the recession, the number of apprentices and so on. Uh, are you clear whether or not the, the main aim of the programme is to serve the economy or whether it's to provide young people with uh, skills they need to improve their employment? The primary aim, as the Auditor General points out, um, as identified by the Scottish Government, is economic development. Within that, it's about enabling the individual. So we know that we know what our, we're very clear on what our overall target is. We're very clear about giving young people, you know, opportunities, um, about offering a balance of portfolio of provision of entry level, you know, entry level jobs, but also um, the ones that are a bit higher skilled. We're also clear that it's about also trying to align it with the economic growth sectors, the key sectors in Scotland as well, and also about improving under-representation. Uh, you uh, well, you've already touched on the fact that it's quite tricky to measure the, the long-term sustainable uh, benefits of apprenticeship. At the moment, you're trying and you're finding new ways of uh, working out, does it improve earnings, does it improve um, sustainable employment and so on, does it lead to a job, in fact. Um, is it... Is it fair to say that um, the target that is absolutely clear in your mind is 25,000? Um, I mean, that's the political target we all talk about, 25,000 apprenticeships. And, and in some ways, that's the dominant target rather than uh, the quality of the job or the improvement to earnings and so on. Is that a fair point to make? You know, you, if you set as a target of it's got to be the quality of the job and the earnings, etc., then that, you know... In terms of administering that, that that's a very complicated way, you know, to do things. If you think about that, and then measuring that as well, it could take ten years, etc. So I said, I said, you know, as a point I made, politicians would need to be very patient in terms of identifying the re results from that too. And the other issue in here is is the challenges that sometimes objectives can sometimes, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. For instance, if you get more engineering. You know, that's good for, you know, key sectors and it also supports the economic growth sectors. It's really good for things like level three ratios and level three, you know, your sustainable jobs, etc. And it's good for new recruits because the engineering industry tends to take people who are, you know, brand new recruits. But it's not good for the gender balance. You know, you know, conversely, hospitality is good for economic growth. It's a, it's a, it's a growth sector. And fem the female participation in that particular occupational framework is really good. Um, but that industry tends to take on people in level two. So level two jobs, we know the economic returns in terms of level twos are less than level threes, etc. So you know th that's why it's a kind of there are, there are different things going on, and one thing can balance out the other. No, I, ac I accept what you're saying. I think the, the the point here is we start from a position. Certainly, the Parliament. I think virtually every party in the Parliament starts from a position that we're very proud of the apprenticeship programme and very keen to promote it. Very keen to promote vocational education generally. Um, but the fact that it was seen as a success, you know, sometimes you can expand programmes and it doesn't necessarily mean you'll repeat the same success. And I think it was the point that Mary Scanlon was making earlier that there's always been a fear that by, for, for example, by increasing the number of level two qualifications and uh, subsuming the skill seekers programme into it, you can possibly devalue. The apprenticeship programme is held in high esteem 
but there's a, a, clearly a difference, as you, as you know, between a, an engineering apprentice, apprentice and perhaps a retail great, uh, level two apprentice. So it's trying to make sure that by expanding a successful scheme, we make it better work for everybody rather than cheapen it or devalue it. And it's trying to work out whether or not, if, if the government, it might not be for you to do, it might be for the government to do, if the government don't set you quality targets, if they only focus on numbers, then you'll, your focus will only be on numbers, it won't be on quality. Well, it's not just numbers, though. I mean, you don't just say to us it's 25,000 and that's it. It's about also those other things that I talked about in terms of individuals, etc., cetera, and, um, and in terms of, of balancing entry, you know, entry-type occupations. And also, let's not forget, you know, the reason why they're at level two is, is because industry have demanded them. I mean, we, we survey sectors every year in terms of what they think the demand is for the different levels and the different occupational areas. The survey results we got this year from, from sector skills councils suggested at level two they would see demand for 15,000, you know, and we've not contracted for that level um, because we're trying to balance the level three and the higher growth and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it is always a, ba a balancing act in terms of what, what you're attempting to do. The recent announcement over the fi extra 5,000 by 2020, um, there's been quite a lot of emphasis on that in terms of it being, you know, the higher level apprenticeships, etc. So, yes, it's always there, but there is there is industry demand. Um, and also there's individual demand for entry-level jobs too. So you're always trying to balance. I'm just, I think the point the Auditor General is, is as flagged up is how do you then, how do, how do we audit that? How do, how do you demonstrate in numbers and targets to the Parliament that you have delivered in quality and not just numbers. How are you? How can you guarantee it? I suppose one of the things is: Are they still in jobs after the end? You know, after they complete their apprenticeship, and we've already got statistics to show that the, the overwhelming vast majority are. Um, well, and sure. isn't reported, is it? it, it well, it's, it's out there. I mean, we've, we've published it. It's the impact. You know, it's the outcome survey. Mm -hmm. um, I so think we had to. I, I could be wrong, but I think we had to ask for it. Um, no, I mean that's been on our website for ages. I mean that's that, yeah. that's out there in terms of post-completion outcomes, and we're about to. So what what you do is you, you track that too. So we're we're going to start the preparatory work soon to maybe do <clears> to do another survey towards the end of this financial year as well. So again, you can't. What you can't do is pester employers all the time. To, you know, like we spoke to you last week, and then because everybody surveys them too. So you've got to balance that appropriately. So so we do. You know, we do part of the reason why we, we've um, a big part of our customer research and evaluation plan with an SDS is around modern apprenticeships because that is about tracking what value do we get it. What do people think about the quality of it? Are they satisfied with the level of services that they get? So, so that's that's the answer to. It. And also things like if we get the link up with the HMRC and benefits data, you can actually track what happens later on in terms of earnings, etc. I think. Uh, submission indicated that this is a co-investment programme. This isn't a giveaway from SDS or government to businesses. This is about co-investment. And I don't think businesses would keep coming back to the table if it wasn't working for them. You've already seen in terms of both engineering and construction the cost that a business will submit to develop young people. So that's, to me, one indicator that the customer is happy and they understand the type of investment they're making and they continue to, to make that. In some areas, the level two type qualification, and speaking to Graham Ogilvy from Construction Skills yesterday, he gave a very good example of developments at the Southern General Hospital. And he'd worked with an industry group because of the amount of dry walling that was required, not just there, but in other large projects, developed and signed off a level two qualification for a trade that uh, has developed because of modern building technology. And the main contractor there took on an extra 20 apprentices. They probably wouldn't have got a structured training programme or that, that type of opportunity before. And a final point, I think, that we're getting more intelligence on through the work that we do with the sectors is to think not just about the new jobs, but about replacement demand for jobs. So if you speak with Select, which is the Electrical Contractors Association, they can already identify probably 900 skilled electricians leaving the sector either through retiral through moving into other sectors or emigrating, and currently there's about 450 to 500 coming into the sector. So these are important barometers. There's only one way to become an electrician in Scotland, and that's through this this programme. It's one of the highest quality programmes anywhere in the in the world for that for that sector. So these are important points that we need to factor in when we're contracting 
around that, that balance. We see the same in engineering. One of the biggest challenges for us in engineering is to work with employers to make them more aware of the demographic challenge they will face in terms of an ageing workforce and the fact that they need to be investing to develop new talent to come through and, and substitute for that. So there's a whole range of stuff there that we need to both take into account, but I think positive signs back from industry that the programmes are working for them as well. I have to say, I think these things are very encouraging. I just, I suppose the point that the committee would be concerned about, that the Auditor General has flagged up, is how to um, capture those, um, that, that feedback, that uh, uh, evidence, that anecdotal evidence, as well as um, measurable evidence, in ways that actually, you know, um, could help, could help you as an organisation, help individuals. For example, just one other point on this is, um, there's clearly varied spend on, on each of the uh, apprenticeship programmes. Are you able at all to um, uh, track the value of the, the different spend? You know, if, if you, if a level two apprenticeship costs you X hundred compared to X thousand for a level four, whatever, uh, are you able to demonstrate the value of that spend? Is, is it, are there, are there any figures or outcome measurements that um, translate? Yeah. We know that every pound of the public purse spent, £8.88, is levered in from employers and from other sources. Um, so, you know, we know that overall our public investment does actually, you know, lever in a substantial um, contribution. The contribution rates um, that, that we pay from the public purse are really the minimum that is possible to pay to encourage training and it's that you know balance of you know public investment against you know market failure um, and we strive to get you know the best value that we can for the public purse and in fact um, this year we have undertaken a review of our contributions and we've um, released phase one of that in this contracting year so some frameworks the longer frameworks where there's more taught off the job learning have actually attracted a higher uh, premium than those where it is purely assessment so all the training is delivered by the employer in the workplace and the training provider goes in and assesses the competency rather than delivers the training. Um, so we have, you know, we strive continually to get best value. Um, you're saying, I, I suppose, and I, and I don't doubt you're echoing the point that Gordon McGuinness made, that employers are quite happy to make their contributions, so clearly it works in that sense. It just, I suppose I'm trying to ask Julia about the individual, there's, there's quite a disparity in the funding that's available at different levels, and it's trying to work out um, you know, how, how you measure that best value you, you're obviously trying to get best value, best value but how do you actually measure it um, if it's a demand led programme then is it simply you know, uh, you know if there's greater demand the public subsidy could actually be less well, you know, so that's, that's, that's one measure but that's not necessarily the best way to, to well, use the money do there, for instance, you use proxy measures because, and, and also what you've got to remember is there's something like 80 frameworks. You know, if you try and conduct a survey and try and get robust levels at 80 framework level, you're a better person than I. You know, it's really, and it would be very expensive. Um, so, what you do is you do things like you ask them, well, do you, things like, do you take, so you to do it by broad occupational groupings. So, are you more likely to train your existing staff or are you more likely <coughs> to take on a new recruit? Now, that tells you something about public, you know, where investment should should more likely be if the if one of the key objectives is actually about getting new opportunities for people you know you look at what age groupings so we so our, our contribution rate is you know th the main groupings around that are what age are they so more money goes to the to the younger age groups it's three different age groupings more money goes to those where um at, at level three, because we know from economic evidence that level three there are higher returns, etc. So there is within the contribution rates and, and also the occupational grouping. Level three, there is stacks of evidence out there about about. But levels, but le, but well, if you think about it, it's all in relative terms, isn't it? So there's higher returns for the individual and in state at level three plus. I mean that that's that's out every you know that's that's been known for a long time. But the level two, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be giving opportunities for individuals to start in the workplace. So that's what I'm saying is you're trying to balance so many things within this in terms of meeting meeting objectives. So there are a variety of kind of proxy measures you can use to look at value within the programme as well. And as I say, one of the things we're doing with government on you know on the back of what the um, 
of what the Auditor General has recommended here is to look at that whole thing about what should we be measuring more. And as I say, we, we do actually quite a lot in that in terms of outcome surveys, but I'm absolutely sure there's more we could be doing. Um, Lou McArthur. Oh, yeah, I'm going to jump back to points that were raised uh, earlier on. Um, in response to Willie Coffey there, uh, listened with interest to the point you were making about tracking outcomes and, and, and the benefits that could be derived from um, sort of data sharing with HMRC and benefits information. I, I can understand the benefits that would be gained from that. I have to say it sets alarm bells running, um, uh, ringing if, uh, if we're harvesting and sharing um, data of that nature. And, and therefore, while I wouldn't necessarily expect a response to that, I would certainly want to put on record that this is not without its its difficulties. But it, it, it was actually more in relation to the point Colin Beattie, I think, started off uh, pursuing with you. I listened with interest um, to what you were saying, Katie Hutton, about the work being done in terms of uh, achieving more of a gender balance and, 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 and certainly in, in particular uh, sector areas. Like Bruce Crawford, I, during Apprenticeship Week last week, visited um, a, a, a stonemason apprentice in, in Orkney um, and uh, she has, um, I mean, the, the, the four-year apprenticeship supported by the Council of Historic Scotland, um, CITB, is, is, is excellent. Um, and what was interesting was that an apprenticeship had been something that had never occurred to her. She'd gone through a, a university degree, had been um, casting around for what she was going to do next. And um, so she came to the, the, the notion of apprenticeships very, very late. Um, now, some of what you've referred to there may, ad may address that. And while there's been some publicity around, um, uh, around her work at St Magnus Cathedral, what was clear was she hadn't had any real engagement with the local schools and speaking directly to um, those who are, are sort of coming in her wake. Um, and, and therefore, I just see that as a huge missed opportunity, not least because of uh, quite how engaging she is and, and, and the story she has to tell about how she came to, to go by that. So I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that all, all the things that you've talked about sound on the face of it um, very reasonable and, 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 and very broad ranging. But from, the, from that simple example, it seems that we're missing a trick in using um, those sort of case studies m more fully. Sorry. I mean, I could go on at length at what we do, and one of the big things that I've obviously forgotten to say there is about the promotion in terms of through the school system. You know, we've got our careers information. You know, we've got our careers coaches in schools who do things really about tackling gender stereotypes as well. On our partner zone, on my world of work, we've got materials, case studies, etc., for teachers to use within schools as well. And maybe that individual didn't get it, but I can assure you, there's a lot of emphasis in trying. Going forward, trying to do, to, trying to tackle those stereotypes, which you know is done by a whole lot of organisations. Where you know there's all those Scottish women in technology, etc. And particularly in apprenticeships, we've done a lot to try and promote apprenticeships as an offer with everything else. I mean, Wood talks about you know parity of esteem issues as well, um, and about trying to. to you know, trying to make sure that work-based learning is seen as the same light as, you know, further and higher education, etc. So, you know, it is a big challenge, but we do do a lot on the promotional side too. In the case of, of, of Sophie Turner, what I'm not trying to do is, 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 is kind of roll back the clock and, and, and say that this should have been picked up earlier. I think, but what it does is it, it provides a, an example of where things haven't necessarily worked in, in the past and, and the things that you were setting out in terms of the work that's been done now. It would appear to be directed at, 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 at trying to address that. What I'm saying is, so you've got this example of, of, of Sophie and the work she's doing, the, the excellent apprenticeship um, that she's uh, embarked on at the moment, but who isn't being utilised to go into to schools, and rather than it being something on a My World of Work website or, or information packs that are given to, to teachers or, or, or to career advisors, you actually speak to the individual themselves. We can give a far more compelling story uh, about the benefits of, 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 of what she is doing. And, and, and that, as I say, seems to me a, a missed opportunity. I, I, I think to agree, and, and case studies is absolutely the way forward with that. And any you know case studies we absolutely cat capitalise on, and we used a lot mm. during school. Scottish Apprenticeship Week. We're actually going to, there'll be another, um, and we'll be looking for your support for this in November, um, there'll be another um, Apprenticeship Week really focused on individuals as well, and that'll be a new departure for this year, doing another one in November to try and cap, you know, as a big part of our efforts to capture the mansions of individuals. So case studies, I absolutely agree with you. The more that you can use people who've actually been through you can tell people what it's like, that, that's absolutely the, the kind of thing that, that, that we absolutely want to capitalise on. 
we also have an ambassador programme which mm -hmm. capitalises on young people who are ambassadors for the apprenticeship programme. So young people identify themselves um, and are identified through case studies and are promoted as ambassadors who go into schools and who go to youth groups and you know anywhere where young people are to um, promote apprenticeships. And in fact, I think you know there was um, some. Um, input to the Youth Parliament um, not so long ago from um, SDS, again promoting apprenticeships um, uh, to young people. So we do, we also have ambassadors from an employer perspective because again, we only have 13% penetration of um, businesses in Scotland. So we rely heavily on word of mouth and others to say this is a great programme. Here are the benefits I've derived from it. So as well as us doing, you know, the stuff through My World of Work and through Gordon um, and the industry managers, we actually have individuals out there going to, you know, business associations and breakfast meetings and whatever and, you know, doing their 60 seconds of or two minutes on, you know, how good it is to have an apprentice. So we do actually have you know, active promotion, you know, through both individuals and employers. But there's always room for improvement. Finally, could I just, again, following up um, the line of question that Ken McIntosh um, was pursuing with you in terms of the the, the variation in the, in the types of support um, that uh, are available. It strikes me both that in the likes of the Highlands and Islands, those returning to the, to the workforce tend to be slightly uh, older, and that has been a, a problem in terms of the focus on uh, particularly 16 to 19 year olds um, up until now, but also in terms of delivering the course element of um, the apprenticeship that can, and Sophie Turner is an example of it, where she's doing the coursework down in Elgin, that um, that, that can be more costly where you're, you're dealing with issues of, of, of rurality. Is there, is there a, a reflection of that in terms of the support that, that is provided through, through SDS across the board? Um, or is there a kind of a, 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 a menu of, of, of support that's, that's linked to whether or not it's, it's, it's a new opportunity or, or skilling somebody who's already in a work, whether it's level two or level three? Um, because I think that would be, again, a, a concern to me that, that it wouldn't fully reflect um, the, 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 the specific um, uh, challenges that, that an employer and an individual would face in a rural community compared to their, their counterpart perhaps in cities. It's a huge challenge and certainly when we were reviewing contribution um, rates that we pay, we did look at geography, but it would be hugely difficult to administer because the funding attaches to an individual and if that individual moves to a different employer then you know it, it could be that the employer's located in a different area you know so the girl from Orkney could work in Ed could finish her apprenticeship in Edinburgh because there's a better job comes up but what we do do is we do support travel and subsistence for individuals who are in training in the rural areas particularly in the highlands and islands and we have support for employers, particularly small employers who would face, you know, huge barriers in terms of cost, even just travel and accommodation. So, yes, we do have additional support for those areas. That, that's helpful. I mean, I would make a plea that whatever other evaluations you're doing, that evaluating whether or not that it, it is an inhibitor, that there isn't more of a reflection of the, the additional cost in, in, uh, available, I think would be, uh, would be pretty key. But thank you. Related to all the issues to do with stats, evaluation, data, performance measures, evaluation, <coughs> uh, we're asking you to drill down and drill down and drill down, but it's very simplest. Your job is to make sure that an apprentice has got the, apprentice, apprentice has got the skills they're in the job and they keep the job. I wonder sometimes, you know, the committee, the parliament, the government, the auditor general imposes a lot of burdens on you. And I just wonder, uh, in terms of these burdens that we're asking you to do in terms of information, how much does that get in the way of doing your job? It would be nice to have less MSP inquiries, I think, from day to day, because I do think we get an awful lot of demand for information, to be honest. It's quite, and that's why we're trying to publish as much as we can, so that we can just refer you to that in terms of going back and forward. So that, that would always be a plea uh, on behalf of colleagues, particularly, who handle all these inquiries as well. I mean, you know, essentially, um, I think that 
there is a law of diminishing returns in terms of drilling down and drilling down because that's when it's back to, you know, if I was, I could bring in one of my colleagues here who's an expert in customer research and valuation where, you know, sample sizes, then you're getting down to that. And, and also you can annoy people by phoning them up. Well, what do you think about that? And what do you think about that, etc. So there is always, you know, you've always got to try and pitch that one um, appropriately. But um, yeah, I mean, a, a plea for um, less and, and less of the same inquiries, please, because we get a lot that are that were asked last week or the week before and all that sort of stuff. So that, that would be nice. Asked evaluations and data. I'll ask you one. Do you know how much you're actually spending on collecting all that data? Um, Information. I mean, I... I, I Whatever you're spending there is not going to apprenticeships. That's what worries me. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I don't have a figure for that, sorry. Um, uh, I want to share the comments made by my colleague Wally Coffey about uh, it's a great report and also by Ken McIntosh and everybody else about the, the great job that modern apprenticeships do. Uh, Ken McIntosh touched on something. I was going to ask some questions about the sort of the forward review of, of uh, how modern apprenticeships have been working, etc. And Ken talked about the the sort of the quality of the training and in terms of how does that impact on the individual at the end of it. You said that you contact them six months after. I'm wondering if six months, I can understand why six months, I think that's really important. But if that's too short a time to see if, for example, they've moved, moved up, I was going to say moved on, but I really mean moved up within the company based on the training that they've had in the modern apprenticeship programme. Pick that up, you know. As I said, about I think 67% from memory either had had a promotion, more responsibilities, or whatever. So you do pick that up at six months, but could could be longer than that. Six months is also what HE does, and I know that there isn't any information on FE at the moment, but they're working on that in terms of outcomes from the money that they spend. Um, so I mean, you could look at making it long term, but then you are into if it's a year, where are they? You know, trying to contact them. So you're 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 really trying to pitch that one correctly as well. Just saying, sixty-seven percent are showing a positive response to that sort of question. Then that probably suggests that six months is, is quite a good average. I, I want to go back to uh, something Fiona Stewart said. I mean, it's been said through the whole session, which I, I found extremely valuable, that it's an industry-led business. This modern apprenticeships, and you started to talk about encouraging employers to take part. Could you go into some more detail about what exactly SDS do to get employers? Because without the employers taking part there will be no modern apprenticeship programme. We, we obviously um, use our network of training providers um, who are you know, our front face with employers, with individuals who are already in training or who are considering training. And those um, training providers um, you know, go out and promote the programme. In many cases, employers will go directly to those training providers because the quality of delivery is excellent, you know, so they've got, you know, a really good reputation. So, you know, you have, um, you know, particular um, employers who like to use particular um, training providers. We also use um, our industry managers and our employer engagement team to go out and, you know, demonstrate the benefits of apprenticeships. But it's not just within our own organisation. Our partner organisations also go out and, you know, drum up um, interest in apprenticeships and um, tell of the benefits. And those are the enterprise agencies. So enterprise agencies, Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, if they're dealing with, for example, inward investment companies or companies who are expanding, will always have in their kit bag apprenticeships because it's a really, really good um, way of de um, developing the workforce, either getting new recruits in for inward investment companies or for expansion opportunities. Um, and so, you know, we do a lot ourselves. We also, through um, local authorities, um, they also promote the benefits. And uh, most recently, obviously, the local authorities have had uh, um, recruitment incentives and they have not just been encouraging employers to take on young people and full stop, no training. They've been encouraging employers to take on young people with training through apprenticeships. So in that way, you know, expanding um, the reach of apprenticeships. But there's, you know, lots of room for improvement and we're not sitting on our, you know, back in our laurels, you know. And, you know, through the part work of the Parliament, I sit in um, a couple of cross-party working groups and, you know, I know MSPs, you know, are 
you know, very keen to go out and promote the benefits of apprenticeships as well. You know, and very often we get, you know, um, inquiries from MSPs about, you know, supporting businesses in their local, local area if they've had some contact and we follow up, you know, all of those and think, you know, that's great. I think it's something, I mean, the big set piece event also obviously Scottish Apprenticeship Week with over 140 events. I think we had something like 25 MSPs involved in that. We also, during Apprenticeship Week, business breakfast, you know, we'd won on engineering down in North Ayrshire last week, trying to get more engineering companies, particularly in an area like North Ayrshire, etc., involved in the company. So a, you know, a wide variety of activities. Why did you like it? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, is, is there any particular uh, part of industry that you're struggling to get into? Because I can't remember what the percentage you said of uh, uh, industry that takes part, but there's still quite a large number that, that don't, isn't there? 15%. Um, you know, again, as the, you know, time progresses, um, new frameworks come on board. So I explained earlier on, we've now got in, you know, insurance and banking, um, professional services. So that's consultancy services round about accounting. Um, we do we have auditing, which has just come on. So it's about promoting the new frameworks to you know maybe parts of industry that don't realise they're there. You know, so part of you know the. Um, the role of sector skills councils is not just to present, develop and present the frameworks for approval in Scotland. It's also about the promotion and encouraging, you know, the employers within their sector from micro businesses through to large employers to actually take up the mantle and use apprenticeships in their workforce development and training. Very much for that. Yes. Point. There's a, I mean, a huge number, a big tail of businesses in Scotland that represent micro businesses and sole, sole traders. The uh, Federation of Small Business undertook a, a study uh, probably about a year and a half ago looking at the challenges for business to, to recruit and I think a lot of our services and our partners have reflected that in terms of a more proactive support mechanism. Uh, business Gateway used the European structural funds to provide more advice around employment. Uh, legislation and, and to provide assistance and for terms of companies to, to recruit. So the whole uh, kind of program of work attached to that. Uh, we worked with the Federation of Small Business, uh, SCDI in the Chambers to develop our Skills Force, which is a, a website which brings together all the offers from local authorities and ourselves and the uh, Job Centre Plus. Uh, and that's got a kind of callback facility. So if an employer is looking for a support, they can quite readily just drop a, an email into the system or contact the uh, customer service desk and we'll arrange a visit to go out and talk them through the process, connect them with partners where that's appropriate if there's a wage subsidy uh, proposition that's available to them. So we've tried to, to open up uh, as much access to the information and services as we can as Fiona says, we can always do more, and at the end of the day, many of the businesses are, are busy running their business, and then sometimes just don't take the, enough time to pause and, and put a structured plan in place. So I think there's a range of mechanisms to support them there. I, I when started, I, I suspect that's just you've just confirmed that, that the small businesses would have been the ones that were most difficult to get into. But are you finding that there's a growing realisation now that they? I mean, there's a nervousness uh, around making a, a commitment, and that should, shouldn't be underestimated. Uh, so if you look at somebody who's maybe an electrical contractor, do they have a sufficiently robust programme of future work to make a four-year commitment to a three-and-a-half-year commitment to a young person? Uh, those are the issues that would play in people's, people's minds if we have just completed a big piece of work in creative industries where... Many people are self-employed and they'll be doing portfolio work. It's not just a single job, they'll be doing different pieces of work. So there's some sectors like that that make it difficult to induct young person and bring a young person into your business or, you know, not just a young person, but, but a, you know, a first employee. So those are some of the challenges. And we're trying to work creatively uh, with government around potential uh, structures around shared apprenticeships that would, would maybe make that easier. But... Uh, we want to maintain the integrity of that employee status model. Okay, thank you. Um, can I thank you for your uh, input to the committee meeting this morning? Um, I don't think anyone would underestimate the challenges uh, that have faced Skills Development Scotland in recent years, but also I think we would recognise 
the vital contribution that you make um, to helping to give young people and older people as well uh, a, a future and uh, to help to develop their skills to, to the full. So, you know, thank you for what you've given us this morning. Thank you for the work that, that, that you do. And I know that um, it's an organisation that has the support of members of this parliament. So thank you for your contribution. OK. Um, item three on our agenda. Um, the committee members will have correspondence from the Scottish Government uh, in response to the Auditor General's report on renewable energy. Um, <clears throat> does anyone have any comments to make? No? Mr Crawford? Good evening. Obviously, there's talk of in the, about an energy skills investment plan in due course. Obviously, I think we need to we do not, as a committee, need to know and understand where this is all going from where we've been at, at least um, from the government. So. Um, well, we can we could write to the government to ask for further information, if you if you wish. When, when the skills investment, just to ask them when it becomes available, to, to reflecting back on what the work that's earlier been done. Well, so they, 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 they will be coming back to us. Right. Okay. So I, I would suggest that maybe at this point we we note their. Correspondence. Okay. Enough, they'll come back to us. Okay. okay. Um, item four. Um, you have a response from the Scottish Government on um, the, the report on Scotland's colleges. Any comments? Nothing. Willie? Uh, thanks, Convener. You'll, you'll note in the, the report there particularly the Auditor General's comments that her next report is due to be published in early 2015. She mentioned that a couple of times in relation to the points that, that we had raised and, and so perhaps the best opportunity for us to, to pick up on this further might be at that point. Yeah, there was one comment that was made um, saying that the Scottish Government expects the Scottish Funding Council, uh, page two, to fund colleges in line with the outcome agreements they negotiate. Um, we do not therefore expect colleges to transfer significant amounts of public funds to ALFs. Now, Times Education Supplement Scotland, I think, have been doing some investigation and I think they've identified um, a substantial figure uh, running into the, the millions. It would, it would be helpful, I think, to clarify exactly how much has been put in to the Arms Length uh, Foundation's yeah, you know, we certainly can ask the Scottish Government to, to, to follow that up um, later on, but I, I think it would be helpful to have the information just now about how much is currently going in to these arms length, you know, because if you're saying that there's not a significant amount, I, I'm not sure quite what the definition of significant is, um, and it's one of the areas that I think concerns um, many people. So. I, I agree with you. I think we should get to the fact of the matter on that yeah. because the, the, there's a statement made there. We need to establish yeah. is it a diminishing amount or is it significant? So we need to okay. find out. Okay. Do you need to write to the Scottish okay. Government asking for clarification on that? What's the up to date figure? Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll hold that until we get a, a response. Uh, item 5, annual report. Uh, any comments or can we agree to publish the report? Mm -hmm. Read. Um, which takes us to item six, which is in private, and at that point um, we will suspend the meeting for a few moments.